All right, <clears throat> you rabble, you teeths. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're going to preach a lesson. I actually did it to the staff, I don't know, a month or so ago, entitled Jesus Loved to Love the Lost. Okay, um, why? Because sometimes we don't really like the lost, let's be honest. <laughs> okay. All right, Luke 15, 1. <laughs> Luke 15, 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners, that's you, were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know, Jesus loved to hang out with broken sinners. Do you? The religious leaders of the day did not. How is it that somebody can be committed... You all right there, Manny? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. How is it that people can start in a religion that's based on love and then somehow get messed up. You know, we were doing our house thing last night, there's a big meeting about it, and there are politicians there. I know that I've spoken to politicians in the past, and many of them really go into politics genuinely because they really want to change the world. And yet somewhere along the line, a lot of them lose their heart. And it becomes political rather than passionate. That can happen to somebody in religion too. People can get into it. They, they seek as a child, as a young person, to really love God. They just think about God. They don't really think about people. They're just like, God, how can I serve you? They pray. And it may not be long, but even as a kid, I remember going into my church in this little village in England and just going in. And the church in those days used to be open. No one in the 70s and 80s used to steal anything. And I remember just going in there, God, I, I just want a relationship with you. I don't understand anything. I'm really feeling a lot. I just want to do something great. And yet, can I say that's always been my heart every day of my life? No. It's really easy to get a messed up heart. You know, Luke 7, 47, it says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Jesus here is talking to a whole bunch of Pharisees, and he's talking about Mary, and he's going, You know why this girl loves much is because she understands that she's been given much i've always noticed in the church that pagans make better christians than religious people people that come from religious backgrounds find it really hard to really love people deeply and passionately they think they do but somewhere along the line they've still got an imprint in their life that being religious is okay. Whereas absolute flagrant pagans like Jesse and me are like, my standard is the Bible. Why? Well, it's the only standard I've ever known. I haven't really had a religious standard. And the reason that we love much is because we really understand how much we've been forgiven. Fung asked me uh, yesterday, I think it was, he go, Joe, why, do you, why are you so passionate? And I said, it's really, it's really, really simple. I've had a very challenging childhood. I felt an enormous amount of pain. I was sent away to boarding school at eight and a half. I didn't feel love. I know what it means to feel love, uh, unloved. I know what it means to feel depressed. I have tried to commit suicide. I know all of those feelings. And I hate, I hate that that was my life. And I hate anybody, and I mean anybody, who has a life like that. Because I know it's horrible to wake up one day and have hopelessness. To wake up one day and to think, to think, you know, I'm thinking about committing suicide today. I know Jesse worked with a lot of underprivileged ch uh, people down in Maroubra, many of which he counseled and never saw again because they committed suicide. That stuff does something to you. But we must love the lost like Jesus loved the lost. It's really interesting. You can lose the thrill of a baptism. I remember uh, when the church was small, man, if we had a baptism in a month, we were there, baby. Like, we were like five hours early. I mean, we were mowing out the sand at Maroubra going, man, this needs to be perfect. We were stopping the sea. We were doing everything because, man, we are having a baptism. 
That's what it was like. And yet even the church now, I can see that some people don't turn up to the baptisms. They're a bit inconvenient at 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. I remember when I was in London, and the church was 1,400 there, we might have 20 baptisms on a Sunday. And I remember thinking, do I really have to go to all of them? I mean, I know I'm on staff, but really another one? One at 9? One at 10? I got baptized. I was so excited for everybody to come. Just like Pete, you know, was so excited for everybody to be there for his mum. You can become so religious, you lose the specialness of each and every single soul. Yeah. Point one, we must have the heart to always go after the one no one else wants to or is noticing. Luke 15, 3. Then Jesus told them a parable. So remember, he's, he's, he's talking to the religious people that have lost their hearts. He says, then Jesus told them a parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? So Jesus always uses stark contrasts, you know, big plank in the eye, you know, it, it's like extreme things. He's going, you guys aren't fired up about 99 baptisms, let alone one. He's like, man, this is the heart you need to have. If one person's unhappy, if one person's in trouble, man, you need to go after it. And then he uses the story, he goes, you know, a lot of you are farmers. I mean, Levites, some of them did have land. He said, man, if you lost a sheep, if money was involved, oh, 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 you'd be counting the sheep. Absolutely. Imagine you, you had $600 in your bank account. All right. And then you lost $10. You'd find out the bank, right? You'd be like, what, what, what's going on here? That's the equivalent of somebody missing on midweek and you following up on them. You need to notice who's not here tonight. You need to notice who's not here every time. And what are we doing about it? We need to notice everything. You know, there's an expression that says the devil is in the detail. When you focus on the 99, and you can, we can all get there. You know what? We've got 99, you know, losing one. It's not bad, right? I mean, we had a big journey. We just lost one. But what if you're the one? What if you're the one? You know, I have done very badly in my life at different points. And um, I mean, that's really mean. Uh, this brother called Matt Wolpert, I'm sure he won't be listening to this, um, had hurt me. So it must have been on a date. So I didn't come to church <laughs> on purpose. And I think he was discipling me at the time. And um, I just stayed in bed. And my bedroom was on the ground floor in the front room. And lo and behold, after church, Matt Paul Wolpert came to my bedroom, knocked on the window. I said, are you in there? Are you in there? And in my hard heartedness, I like, I ain't answering him. I'm going to make this boy suffer. I still, I still remember the wickedness of it. But he came. And I knew it. And then because I was mean to him, I was like, man, I've got to go back to church and I've got to apologize. I've got to really deal with this. But he came, and I'll always remember it. If he hadn't have come, maybe I'd have gone, you know what? Proves he doesn't love me. Proves he doesn't love me. Jesus teaches us not to look until you find the lost sheep. Sorry, to look until you find the lost sheep. In this whole parable, there's an attitude of, I'm going until I find them. Is that your attitude towards the weak? Is that your attitude towards the people that you've met and follow up? Is that your attitude towards the fallaways? Is it something that you go, man, I am going after this person until they literally delete my phone and move? And there are a few people that have done that to me. But you can never look at somebody and go, I won't believe in them. It is our greatest sin, I believe, to not believe in other people. Why? Because when we're not believed in, it crushes our spirit. It does. When somebody is already struggling inside their heart to go, I feel useless, and you go, you know what, you are. That's it, you can have snuffed out their last little flame in Christian life. And I'm not necessarily talking about the Christians, I'm talking about people that you reach out to. So often, I was talking to Cedric about uh, the friends that he brought on uh, uh, to his baptism, and he was just going through them and said, well, this guy, you know, he's just given up on all church. He's just given up feeling like, no, I don't want anything to do with it, because I'm so hurt. 
But he came to our, see Cedric's baptism. That's like a really dim flame that you need to feel, fuel it. You need to get it into a roaring fire and use every opportunity. There's a real attitude here of continual determination. You know, getting everybody to the conference. We've still got, I don't know, eight spaces free. We're going to have to pay for them. Just hook by crook. I tell the staff, I say, just throw them on the bus. Okay, you've got a great study, throw them on a bus. We'll figure it out. Just throw them on a bus. Okay, somebody's with just throw them on a bus. Let's just get them there. Conferences really change people. Yeah. There needs to be an attitude of it. It's unacceptable for somebody not to come. Not in a self-righteous, oh, they're a sinner. If somebody is already weak and they don't want to come, they're the people that most na need to come. Does that make sense? And you've just got to get them, pick them up, pay for an Uber, do whatever it takes. I appreciate so many of you have paid for people from Samoa. Literally have. Some of you have paid for two people on flights from Samoa. God will reward your heart. Yeah. You know, when we went over um, to uh, the mainland, as it were, we found people that were in desperate need of Christianity. So that's why we're sending people there. Because they need it. I think about, um, you know, uh, Andrew Barber. I'm constantly in, in touch with Andrew Barber. He ain't going nowhere. And I've been uh, texting him. And he's, you know, he's a funny fella. Um, and I said, so uh, I said to him, like, okay, got with him Monday. Come on. I've been thinking about what you said. Can I help you find your love with God? He went, don't know. And then he sends me a picture and he, and he basically went to the church in Auckland. You know what I mean? So he's sort of on one aspect. He's like, He's like the guy who, you may be watching Andrew, this is what you like, okay. Oh. <laughs> He's like the guy who runs up to Jesus and goes, get away from me, Lord. Right. That's exactly what he's like. He's coming to the conference. That's like running up to Jesus and like, do you want to be a Christian? No! <laughs> well, there's something in there, right? There's something in there. And as long as there's something in there, I'm going to fuel it. Well, what if it takes 60 years for him to be, you know, get us out right? What if it does? What if it does? But you can never give up on people. On. You know, even in the fellowship, one of the things, one of my pet peeves is, it's Sunday, and immediately people are talking to Christians. Christians are talking to Christians. On a Sunday, you need to be talking to visitors. You already know the Christians, okay? We, we have many, Wednesday is a real fellowship night. Our goal is to really get involved in other people's lives. And you'll see me, I'll go to people and go, hey, you're talking to Tristan, can you do that? I remember when, um, uh, I was first an intern in London, and there were 1,400 people in the church. And we met in a cinema, and one of those cinemas that had like a thousand on the bottom and a 500 seater on a on a second tier. Okay, so it was a we used to meet as a whole church in London, and I wasn't very good at bringing visitors in. I really didn't know how to do it, but I thought, you know what, my goal is to help my ministry grow. And then I figured out because there are so many people, and there weren't mobile phones there or internet or anything like that that people would come, the latecomers would come, and they'd sit up the top of the balcony, all right? And people would miss their visitors. So I had this great idea. I'd just go up to the top balcony, and I'd figure out most of these people are not Christians because they were late, and I just went up, what's your name? What's your name? I want to study the Bible with you. I want to study the Bible with you. And I grew a whole ministry in London of people that lived all around London, weren't in my ministry. I just kept baptizing them and went, oh, hold on, he lives over in the West. I said, yeah, but I've been studying the Bible with him all week. In other words, it doesn't matter if you bring people or you don't bring people. You're, I mean, it does in one sense, but if you don't get anybody, then just help somebody. Get in there. Get involved. If somebody's weak, get in there. You add so much more. The reason why people get strong is they have multiple relationships. Yeah. Yeah. See every opportunity. Grab every opportunity. Um, you know, when it comes to other people's contacts, you know I'm always stealing your friends. You know, if you bring a friend, I'll take their telephone number. And I'll just keep going on with that. I, you know, I'm reaching out to a guy in the ISOC right now. And uh, I went up to uh, uh, Len earlier. I said, oh, I'm getting with him again this week. He goes, really? I said, yeah, I'm not waiting for you, slow coach. <laughs> I'm like, um, yeah, yeah, bit of challenge there. Okay, he's doing great with his Bible talking. So. But it's like, you've got to, there's got to be an urgency. I never give up on people. I'm constantly, constantly in touch with people. It should be that you are so in touch with the people that you have met that you forget who they are. Does that make sense? As in, you have so many people that you're reaching out with, and because you don't throw their number away, and because you don't give up on people, you suddenly go, hey, who are you? I did that this week. I was this guy, Ray, 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 Ray. And so I went to text him, and it's my last text there. And he, and he said, you know, are you back yet? Or something. I said, hey, are you back yet? And I get this long phone call, yeah, I'm back. Where have you been? Like this, I'm like, 
you're going to come to church? I said, yeah, not this one, but next week. And I'm like, Ray, Ray, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so Ray's coming this Sunday. <laughs> But that's, there's part of it that should almost be like that because you don't give up on people. Maybe I haven't spoken to them for two months, but you've got to really go after people. Even when Emmanuel took over the North, I told him, you know, in our one notes, we have every single study that came the whole year. I said, if you've got nobody to baptize, call up Chi and go through every single study that happened in January, February, and March, ask him to set the study back up again. In other words, you have to turn over every base again and again and again and again. Some of you go, well, I've reached out to them for eight months and they're not interested. It's really interesting. If you met that person today, you'd be super excited. I don't know if you know how I originally met Andrew. I met Andrew at Sydney Uni um, and he had parked illegally in, um, the, in uh, um, uh, office work. You're only meant to be there an hour, I think. Anyway, so, um, and this was a conversation. Hey, do you want to come on a Bible talk? Yep. Can I, uh, can I have your number? Yep. Bye. That was it. <laughs> Then I followed up with him for eight months. Now, from iPhone, when I followed up with him and called him, what have you, it came from my email, because iPhone does that. And my email is whatifgod.com. So he said, every time I saw it, I thought you were just this religious nutter. There's no way I'm coming to your church in the entire world. Well, then I swapped my phone to a Samsung, and it just came from a normal number. He went, oh, he's not become a religious nutter anymore. I'll come to church. <laughs> So the only reason he wasn't coming to church is because it was coming via my email and now I changed phone. Now he's felt, he felt different. So how many of your friends in your phone maybe are open, but there's something that's not coming because we just haven't connected with them in the right way? You know, we need to turn over every stone. Some people in life make things happen and others are forgotten in history in ambiguity. The truth of it is we only remember people that make things happen. The SAS, which is one of the special forces, possibly one of the first, their motto is, who dares wins? It is our job to find fruit where others do not see it. It is my job as a church leader to find leaders where other people don't see it. And you know what I feel about everybody in this room? You are an evangelist, you are a ministry leader, you just haven't figured it out yet. Because we don't have enough. How you see people how you think about people produces things. We have to always have a heart to love the lost. Point two, get everyone involved in the victory. So Luke 15. So Jesus really going at these Pharisees, man, I'm going to pummel your hearts. I'm going to teach you. So it's Luke 15, 5. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who don't, do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found a lost coin. In the same way, I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In both of these stories, there is a great victory. But in both of the stories, there's only one person doing the work. The friends do absolutely nothing. So how come they get to invite them to the party? Right? I mean, if they've done nothing, why do, they, why do you invite them? I mean, they've done nothing. I mean, didn't even bring an apple pie or anything. So, so why is Jesus teaching this? In the ministry, I was talking about how do you motivate people? Well, baptisms produce baptisms. Enthusiasm produces enthusiasm. Bible study produces Bible study. Great prayers with people makes them want to pray again. You have to get every single person in your ministry involved in victories in order for them to change. If you just stand opposite somebody and go, you're a sinner, you don't love the lost, and that's just wicked, they will go, yes, you're right, and I'm not doing anything. Because we're all rebellious when we're rebuked, right? But if you go, hey, man, can you help me study the Bible? Hey, can you come into this Bible study? So with Cedric, I was pulling in lots of different people to come and sit in the Bible study again. Can you get excited with me? Cedric's going to become a Christian. And then I was out studying the Bible the other night, and guess who was in a Bible study? It was Cedric, all dressed to the smarts at 9 o'clock, jumped in a Bible study. I'm going for it, baby. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going for it. Okay. You turn a church by turning people one by one by one by one. If we run off as leaders and we only get with people on our own thinking, I want to be efficient, you've missed the point. 
People do want to do what's good, but it's really hard to be motivated every day. That's why we go to gyms with other people. That's why we're in sports teams. Very few people succeed on their own. So you have to get everybody involved. You know, in trying to turn Ray, I've got him involved in the studies in Cedric. I think with uh, trying to turn some people for the New Zealand mission team, we had them all evangelizing together. So there was this constant joy and constant uh, uh, going out with each other. You know, get people discipling other people. If you want somebody to grow, give them responsibility. So I love Millie. Millie is awesome. Very sad to see her go. But when Millie became a Christian, she struggled to give sacrificially. So I made her the administrator. And then what? Well, then she'll figure out how little she gives. She'll see how much everybody else gives. She went, I didn't ever said anything to her. I just let her do the contribution. She's like, dang, I don't give a lot. I didn't say anything. What changed it? She got involved. She had the skill set, but now she saw where her heart was at. If you give people responsibility, most people hate being a hypocrite deep down. So if you allow people to disciple people, they go, dang, I've just told him he needs to evangelize. I suppose I better do some, haven't I? <laughs> That's it. When you hold off, you go, they're not worthy of responsibility. Who is worthy of responsibility? Please. I remember when we led the North in, um, in uh, this is a funny one. So there was this, uh, in the North in LA, and this guy had been immoral that week. Comes from a bad background, a real gangland background. And I got with him, and he was really cut. I mean, really David cut. Okay. So I had him do communion that week. Everybody went up to me. How can you have him when he, doing communion when he's so weak? I said, well, he's repented. They, well, that's great. Well, who better to do communion than a repentant person? He couldn't believe it. He walked around after and went, this is my church. So he went from in my immorality to, this is my flat church. This is my church. <laughs> But isn't that how we're meant to treat people? Not self-righteously looking down, but understanding. You need to fill people with pet faith. People are selfish. You have to teach people to fall in love with God. It doesn't come naturally. You need to show them how to love God. You know, who out of all the ministry I have genuinely wanted to go in the ministry? Land didn't. Scotty didn't. Dean didn't. Chi didn't. Tegan didn't. I had to persuade them. I had to teach them. I had to teach them the joy of going in the ministry. It's up to us to fuel people through our excitement to pull them into our lives. You know, leadership forces change as it exposes you. People get involved and they do something. They find out their failure. That's why I push Len. You've got to start your Bible talk. Come on, come on. And he's grown so much in two weeks, more than other times in his life. Start a woman's Bible talk. Take on some responsibility. That's why I want people to go to Cambodia. You go to Cambodia, it will change your life. Yep. You'll never be the same again. And then point three, go after those that have offended God and have offended you. Now, this is difficult, isn't it? Luke 15, 11. Jesus continued. So he's pummeling these hard hearts of the religious. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and it began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields of, to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hard servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with, with compassion for him. He ran to his sons, threw his arms around him and kissed him. You know, I'll just go there. Here's the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son was offensive. He was absolutely offensive. He's like, Dad, I don't love you. I just want your money. And I want it before you're dead. That's like you going to your parents and going, I know you paid off your mortgage, but can you remortgage it, please, and give me half? I mean, talk about entitled. Talk about offensive. And yet, when he repents, God's like, 
Open arms, baby. Let's come, let's, let's celebrate. One thing you have to understand about human beings is we're idiots. We're absolute idiots. We're offensive. We're stupid. We hurt people. We hurt, actually, we hurt the people that are the ones that love us the most, right? We hurt our spouses more than anybody. We hurt our kids. Our kids hurt us the most. But you've got to understand, you've got to learn to embrace being offended. Because, unfortunately, there's something about humans, whereas when they're really hurt, there's this weird thing that they do where they hurt other people to prove that other people don't love them. And they hurt them and go, see ya, see, I knew you wouldn't love me. And they can really push back. So many of the people we reach out to are really damaged and hurt. And they've been to churches before and they've been ignored. And maybe they just sat in the back and went like this. They went, see, nobody loved me. I went there, nobody even spoke to me. I mean, maybe it was their fault they were at the back and ran out straight away. But humans do this really weird thing when they're hurt. And they just blame everybody. In business, and I've said this before, we were always told to go after the clients that nobody else wanted. Because when you win them, you'll have them for life. Find the most horrible, ignorant person. They know they're difficult to deal with. But they still have to do business. And so we'd make a business out of going after the businesses that nobody else wanted. And then we had a really strong, solid business because nobody else wanted them afterwards and they weren't attacked. It's the same with Christians. If you can find someone that's super damaged, super hurt, you love them, you turn them, you have the most loyal disciple you will ever have in your entire life. Don't look for people that are already... There are very few, and I have to say, Chloe, uh, wherever she is, is a unique individual. I always say there are three motives for most people becoming Christians. One is John 8, truth seekers. Most of us are John 13. We're love seekers. You know, you'll know them by the love. Occasionally, you find somebody who actually just wants to do something great with their life. And most of us do, but not really. In terms of we want to be loved and then we'll do something great. Chloe's one of those people who generally said, I don't need God, I don't see my need for God, I've got everything, I, I don't need that. I said, I know, but God's given you all that to do something great. And as we challenged her, and I studied the Bible, and I said, you know, you can't become a Christian unless you go in the ministry. She's got a very unique heart and will do really great things. And we need great people like that. But that's really, really rare. Most people are damaged as, are really, really damaged. And a lot of them don't know, and some of them have even left. They don't even know how to come back. So it's great to have Z, who was one of our first ever baptisms, a Bible talk. And he came, and again, he was a little bit like the guy that runs up to Jesus and get away from the Lord. He, didn't, he sort of says, you know, my wife wants to start the Bible now, sort of bring him back to my church. So he wants it, but he, he doesn't know how to communicate. There are so many people who have fallen away, just don't even know how to walk in the door. They're ashamed. And there are other people that are religious who think they've fallen away from God. Maybe they've never even become a real Christian, but that's how they think. Or there are people who feel like, have you ever met somebody who goes, I can't come to your church, I'm too bad? Have you ever had that? I've had that. Somebody goes, I come to your church, I'm too bad. We need to welcome these people and go, you, you don't understand the love of God. Right. We have to really watch that we're not religious. Every time we get a phone number and we don't follow up on somebody, we're teaching them that God is unloving. That's what we're doing. They're going to look at us and say, you're religious. You got my number, and I knew it was just some sort of game or some ploy. Or There was no sincerity there. If we don't love people, if we aren't when they reject us when we study the Bible, when they reject us or the gospel when we study the Bible with them and they're rude to us, that's the moment the love begins. Now, Muhammad Ali was, was said as a boxer, he wouldn't count the sit-ups until they started hurting. And you'd only start counting from then. That's like us with studying the Bible people. We don't love people until they hurt us. Then we know. Then we know whether we really, really love people. I appreciate, you know, I went over to Obed's Bible Talk or, or the Bondi, and there was Lynn, and there was Hadja, and Obed's like, man, I'm going after these people. And you can know. Obed's Mr. Love, right? Okay, whether it's with his wife-to-be or whatever. But everybody, you know, uh, uh, old, um, um, Cedric moved in with Obed. He said, oh, I just love the flat. I thought, that's not a surprise. And you're in there with Roger, you're in there with James, you're in there with Obed. And he's like, me and Obed just talked the whole night. And we're like, it's 2 o'clock, it's 3 o'clock. I said, oh. <laughs> so the, I think the conference has already started for those two. <laughs> but you've got to understand that. One of the other things you've got to understand is if you can't love the Christians in the church, 
You can't love the people out the church. True. You've got issues in the church. You're going to have issues converting people. Because Christians will forgive you. But here we really, really see that we must resolve people's attitudes. They may be proud. They may be offensive. They may have lied to us. They may have not turned up. They may have, you know, like I said, they may have been me inside being mean to the uh, Matt Wolpert, as it were. But that's humans. We've got to be above that. You know, Jesus loved to love the lost. Do you? We have a superb opportunity. I turned to the staff and said, you know what you need to do? You need to go evangelize today, meet somebody that comes to midweek, meet somebody that comes to Sunday. They come to the conference, become a Christian. This is a real opportunity. Every wedding we have, every conference we have is a unique opportunity. It only comes once a year or so. Get on the phone. Study the Bible with somebody tomorrow night. Have a blowout Friday Bible talk. Talk to them about the conference. Talk about coming. And use this incredible opportunity to really propel people forward. I appreciate, you know, JT's talking about possibly my father will come down. How incredible that will be. Are we going to get Ted there? Are we going to get Jen there? Are we going to get all those people there? Never give up on people and really use the opportunity. So Jesus loved the loved. We must learn to go after the one that nobody else wants to. That needs to be your attitude as a Christian. You're at church and you go, who's unhappy? Who do I need to go and speak to? Get everyone involved in the victory. Don't get frustrated at your ministry. Get them involved. And then go after those that have offended God and you. I'm sure you could all write down five people you're pretty ticked off with. They're the people I want you to go after between now and Sunday. And amen.